Welcome to ACPN's Career Conversations. We're just going to wait for a moment until we let everybody in, and then we'll shortly get started. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, I think that um, people can start. I can continue to come in, but in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Dr. Udo, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. I am Captain uh, Dr. Rachel Ido Wu, and I'm very, very uh, pleased to be able to open uh, this recurring webinar uh, series known as Career Conversations with a specific focus today on careers in governmental and international public health. I will be the facilitator for this session and I will very shortly introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Joseph P. Iser. Next slide. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Next. Our agenda for today uh, is to provide a very quick our agenda today is to provide a very quick introduction to uh, ACPM. Uh, I will introduce myself briefly, uh, uh, just giving you some sense of my career journey in, in governmental and international health. Then I will introduce Dr. Joseph Iser, who will uh, uh, spend some time talking to us about his very rich history in um, uh, public health. And then we will uh, come to you all with an, uh, uh, a set of um questions and answers around our careers and things that we can possibly share that will um, help you as you think about your, your, your next steps in your careers. Next slide. So a little bit about myself, as I mentioned, uh, I am the, um, uh, I am Captain Dr. Rachel Ito and I am the country director for the United States Centers for Disease Control in the CDC's office in Liberia. Uh, I've been in this position for about two and a half years, um, and it would be um, probably helpful to share just a little bit about how I got here. Um, so one of the things that I think um, is really, really true for me is that I'm always um, uh, pursuing opportunities to make the, the teams, the programs, the organizations I'm part of um, pursue ex excellence, even in sometimes the most difficult circumstances. Um, I went to medical school uh, in California, uh, UC, UCSF, and then from there went to Vanderbilt residency um, for general surgery and critical care. Um, I had um, a lot that I got from that particular training path, uh, but as I looked at the way in which uh, clinical surgeons uh, and, and academic surgeons practiced in the United States, those who wanted to have overseas careers of any kind, um, whether it was uh, practicing as a surgeon, or doing um, advising and consulting with governments around their health systems or uh, doing relief work in humanitarian settings. What I saw was a lot of uh, very motivated and dedicated people who were doing all of their international work on their vacation hours. Um, their academic or their clinical practices in the United States were fully full-time and demanding, and it was very difficult to carve out protected time uh, to do overseas work. Uh, some academic centers in the in the uh, universe that I was part of at that time were a little bit more generous. You could set up uh, rotations where you would do three months overseas and then three months in the States or six months overseas and then six months in the States. But as I started to look more and more at the types of public health problems or clinical problems I was interested in solving, I got very impatient with the idea that I would only be dropping in for three months and then disappearing for a full year and then coming back the next year. I really wanted to be part of a an approach to overseas work that would allow me to be planted firmly. Um, and so I made a difficult decision as I got towards the end of my um, general surgery training uh, that I would um, pursue a path in public health. Um, and at that point I was um, still at Vanderbilt and I um, had a very, very understanding program director. So for those of you that are um, still trying to figure out where you wanna go with residency or fellowship, don't, don't minimize the importance of being in a program where you're treated um, as an individual and people really care about you. Uh, my general surgery program director said, okay, um, we'll help you get your MPH um, and then you can 
chart your course from there. So I did a two-year MPH at Vanderbilt. Um, and I met a lot of wonderful faculty in the Vanderbilt program, many of whom had either worked for CDC in the past or had done the uh, sort of um, intro to uh, public health uh, work that the CDC calls the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Um, and so that was my choice. I chose to finish the MPH program and then apply to the EI program, Epidemic Intelligence Service, which is a two-year applied epidemiology training program, which essentially takes all the skills that you learn in the classroom from an MPH perspective and teaches you how to apply them in the real world where uh, communities, health systems are, are built and, and, and challenged every day with, with communicable disease threats. <clears throat> Um, I started off at CDC in 2012. Um, I did two years with a humanitarian response branch that put me all over the world responding to natural disasters, uh, uh, displacements of people due to civil war, um, displacements of people due to, um, as I mentioned, natural disasters, and learned how to essentially apply population health principles to keeping refugees and internally displaced people safe. From there, I moved uh, uh, into my first full-time job with the CDC um, as a epidemiologist working for the National Public Health Institutes program. That job was basically an opportunity to help uh, ministries of health think through how to organize their public health functions under a unified entity like the CDC. But in most of these cases, they called them they called them NPHIs or National Public Health Institutes. From there, I went on to become a branch chief at the CDC office in Mozambique. Uh, I met I kind of pivoted back to a clinical role in that job. Um, although I was still working on health systems, it was specifically health systems for the delivery of HIV and TB services to adults uh, in Mozambique living with HIV. Um, and I stayed in that job for three years, and then I moved here uh, to the CDC Liberia office uh, to become the country director. And here our portfolio is much more about uh, cross-cutting health system strengthening, looking at anything that can possibly cause um, uh, a, a, a country's uh, challenges with communicable diseases to get out of control, like we experienced with COVID or uh, in Liberia's case, as they had once experienced with Ebola. So I'm here for now, I'm enjoying uh, the work very, very much and very, um, of course, pleased and thrilled uh, that um, ACPM gave me the opportunity to be here as your facilitator today. Next slide. So before I uh, 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 pass the uh, floor to Dr. Iser, we did want to present one slide that uh, shows that ACPM uh, has its physicians in a variety of employment settings. And as you can see here, uh, more than 2,000 physicians are featured or are, are working in sectors that range from uh, academic settings like universities, uh, federal service, whether that's the government um, or military, um, and that government uh, position could be state, local, or federal. We have some individuals who are self-employed, and then you can see others that are um, sort of evenly split between um, private sector, industry, and um, uh, uh, health management systems. Next slide. So now it's my distinct pleasure to uh, share with you a little bit about our featured speaker for today. Dr. Joseph Iser is the recently retired Chief Health Officer for the Southern Nevada Health District, known as SNHD, and a member of the ACM, ACPM Board of Regents. Dr. Iser has had a 40-year career in public health as a provider, staff member, and a leader. His range of experience includes the U.S. Public Health Service and a progressively larger list of public health departments and districts. In addition to his role as the Chief Health Officer, Dr. Iser also launched a new preventive medicine residency program while at the SNHG and maintains his role as the president of the Nevada Public Health Institute, of which he is one of two founders. Dr. Iser received his medical degree from the University of Kansas and is board certified in internal medicine, general preventive medicine, and public health and occupational medicine with a broad, broad background in primary care, public health, and medical education. And with that, um, I turn it over to you, Dr. Iser. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dowu. I really appreciate the introduction. So, excuse me. <clears throat> what I thought I would do is to talk about my career journey. Uh, again, it's over 40 years now, and I'm going to try to go through this uh, pretty quickly uh, so that we have time for questions at the end. Um, and what I wanted to focus on was a little bit of uh, my international health. So I've defined international health pretty broadly. Uh, for example, when I talk about medical school, I did two months on a Native American reservation up close to the Canadian border, uh, Fort Belknap and Rocky Boys, 
uh, in Montana. And then um, I joined the US Public Health Service uh, and I have a broad career there. I'll focus a little bit on my time at the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences and CDC. And then I retired from there in 2007. And then point, post uh, USPHS, I'll talk about my county health career uh, and then post-retirement, which has been far busier than what I would have hoped. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, my last two months in medical school at the University of Kansas, I knew that I was going to have to pay off an obligation to the US Public Health Service. Uh, during my second year in medical school, I was involved in a flood. Luckily, I had already applied for the scholarship um, otherwise, uh, I may have had to have dropped out of medical school, but I did get the scholarship, which supported me through my last two years of medical school. Uh, this is my old dog, Sadie, who I'd had for many years at this point. Uh, we slept out in the open on the way up to Montana. Those little white patches on her head and neck are frost. We both got frosted on uh, that night on the way up to Montana. Next slide. I spent two months uh, up in Fort Belknap, Fort Belknap um, and it was with the Assiniboine and, and uh, other um, Native American tribes. There were two facilities on this Indian reservation. The hospital was at the north and there was a clinic in the south. And the doctors who were there were more than happy as an almost graduate from medical school to allow me to go down to the southern clinic on my own uh, to take care of patients. I always try to put in pictures like this. This um, was at a powwow on Rocky Boys, which is a nearby reservation. <clears throat> all those, although these young women are now uh, probably in their 30s, uh, I always try to put a slide in here because this is the reason why we practice is to take care of our patients. And I had uh, all Native American patients while I was there for those two months. Next slide, please. Um, after that, and after I finished my residency, I did my internship in Massachusetts, came back to Kansas City, uh, and finished my residency at the UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, um, at the city county hospital there. Um, and I was in the public health service during that period of time, and I did two years of uh, clinical service in internal medicine, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, one was at a small clinic nearby whose uh, patients were mostly uh, underserved people. I had um, deaf patients, I had gay patients, I had uh, African American and Latino patients, um, and uh, a lot of Native American patients who were in the Kansas City area during my residency. Next slide. Um, after that, I went to the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. This is back when I was a lieutenant commander and I uh, was first stationed there. And uh, you can't tell, but that's a mess dress uniform. Uh, Dr. Dowu probably knows what that is. That's what you wear to formal dress um, parties when you're in the service. Um, and at the Uniformed Services University, which was mostly Army, Navy, and Air Force, with only a few public health uh, students, I wanted to show that a well-dressed officer uh, can be deployable in any kind of an emergency. Yes, this is a setup picture on the left, uh, but I was repelling down the side of a building. During those uh, six years that I was there, we did a lot of things. This was when we went up to uh, Colorado and Wyoming on the right, and we're doing uh, an experiment at high altitude to see high altitude a physiologic performance on a standardized diet. I was the doctor on board and the leader of, I'll call it an expedition, uh, because we camped out every single night of uh, those uh, six weeks uh, as it was. Uh, every week I would examine uh, the medical students who came along with us, along with the other adult volunteers, uh, looking at their retinas, taking their blood pressure, listening to their hearts and lungs, and then performing uh, medical tests on them. This was one of my special assignments while I was teaching. Um, it's called, I'll call it deployment medicine for Army, Air Force, Navy. That's sort of your first assignment. 
in any one of those services. And for us, it's emergency re, uh, preparedness and response. Next slide. Um, I was a ship's doctor uh, for three months during that six year period. Um, and I did do the dive medical officer training. I don't have a picture of it, but I also did the flight medical surgeon training through the Air Force. Air, Air Force. This uh, on the left was um, a training module through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which at that point was our seventh uniformed services. They fly planes through hurricanes and drive ships through seas to look at uh, oceanographic, ocean, oceanographic and atmospheric research. I was also deployed for a couple of months along the border. This is in Brownsville, Texas on the right, um, where during those years, we had refugees coming across from El Salvador and Nicaragua. Some of you may be old enough to remember that. They were uh, swept up by INS and taken to detention centers. This is the detention center that we opened. It was a former USDA research center. We had to at first get soil samples to see where there might be pesticides, rope off those areas. Our clinic was one of these buildings. We had to clean it out. For those of us who know about Texas in the south, uh, southwest, southeast, uh, it had mud dauber nests all over the inside of it that we had to wash and scrape out. We had to turn on the water, turn on the gas, turn on the electricity. And then we took care of families mostly and uh, single unaccompanied adults at this uh, center. There was another center a couple of miles away that um, uh, housed um, unaccompanied adults without uh, children and families. I was here for a couple of months during one of the summers uh, during that whole six year periods, period at the Uniformed Services. Next slide, please. Uh, the, this was my clinic staff. Uh, you can probably see my little face in the middle with someone holding horns above my head. Um, that's back when I had color to my hair and uh, I just had a mustache and it had color to my mustache back then too. Uh, this was staffed by all active duty US Public Health Service personnel. Uh, they ranged from David who is in the back, uh, in the back row, second from the right, uh, Otto, uh, uh, Carl was his name, but his first name was Otto. My dad's name was Otto, so I always called him Otto, to the other nurse practitioners and social workers down in the front. Um, the uh, young woman who is at the shoulder of the woman in the khaki uniform with a big smile, I think she's holding horns above one of the nurses. Yeah, that was her. She was a social worker, Native American uh, from um, uh, uh, near the Navajo reservation. And she and I would talk every evening about all the incoming clients and she and I would mostly cry. Because of their circumstances. Um, next slide. Also during this period of time, I did a lot of emergency preparedness response and other exercises, especially during the break in the school year during the summer. Uh, what you see on the left is we were up in Kodiak Island with the Marines doing uh, winter exercises. Also again, measuring physiological response to stress. Uh, you can see it was probably quite cold. This was during um, the night and you can see the snowshoes. Um, on the right-hand slide uh, is when we in the U.S. Public Health Service called PHS-1, uh, a DMAT team, uh, participated in active exercises by the um, Army and Marines down at Fort Lejeune. Um, and we are actually taking care of patients in, uh, uh, in this slide. Next slide. Uh, I also did the very first lecture on how to prepare for uh, and determine resource requirements for refugees. Part of that was due to my experience and uh, the Army and Air Force and other services were starting to take care of it. You all won't recognize this format, but in order to do slides, we either did two by two slides, that's, and then what we would otherwise do is type out 
our lectures or like in this case, the resource requirements on a piece of white paper and then go and copy it on um, a uh, to, to put under an overhead projector on a clear plastic sheet. It's not important uh, what's on this, but it was the first attempt for us in the military to start to look at really what we might need uh, during um, during these emergencies. Next slide. Uh, during the period of time that I was a ship's doctor, we did two things we, that got me these cute little certificates. Uh, we went across the equator, and if you're on a working ship crossing the equator, uh, you become a shellback, and uh, you go through a um, interesting uh, series of stresses that the other ship uh, inhabitants put you on. Uh, this ship ha had wage marines, which are the equivalent of enlisteds, and uh, there were things like capturing me during supper, taking me outside, hosing me down uh, on the ship's prow, uh, making me do various things. It was one of the most fun times in my life, and I was a ship's doctor for three months uh, during one of uh, our summers. We also went through the Panama Canal, so I have an equivalent kind of a beautiful uh, remembrance of that, that the ship's captain, also another auto that you can see in the bottom right uh, signed for me. Next slide. I also received my doctorate in public health uh, during some of this time. Uh, that's Princess Anne on the right, who is the patron uh, royal for the London School of Tro Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Next slide. This is me at, at graduation with some other graduates. Um, I already had my MD hood, and so I got to wear the MD. I also had my, um, I did not have my DRPH hood yet, uh, but I was able to wear the Masters of Science that I received from the London School um, at this. Um, this was a fun time. Uh, some buddies of mine from the DRPH program uh, uh, Nora and Pat went over with me. We traveled through Scotland, came back, gra I graduated. They did get a picture of me with Princess Anne, but I couldn't find it for this lecture. And uh, then we went, uh, Nora and I went over to uh, Ireland. Next slide. Uh, before I, I go on, uh, other international experiences was, uh, again, during one of our summers, uh, some other faculty and I went over to observe a tri-service exercise on a downed airplane in Europe. Uh, we flew a C-130, and if any of you know what a C-130 is, it's a medium-sized aircraft, but it's propeller. You do not want to take a propeller aircraft um, across the Atlantic Ocean. It takes a long time, and we only had a barrel uh, to urinate in along the way. Um, after we got there, we went through the Azores, we went to Spain. The exercise was in Germany, down in Sigonella in Italy, back, and then we returned back that same route uh, to get back to the United States. I also was deployed uh, to Iceland uh, as part of the faculty for um, ACLS, ATLS at the university. Um, and I taught ACLS and ATLS to um, active duty and contract physicians um, and nurse practitioners in Iceland. Uh, did the same thing twice in Okinawa. Uh, during that period of time, I also was, uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, going overseas to meetings uh, with what was then called the, well, it's the Western Pacific Regional Office of the WHO um, and to other uh, administrative meetings um, over there. Next slide. Uh, I, I'll continue with the US Public uh, Health Service. I did six years as the Regional Health Administrator, which is the Chief Health Officer for the five states of Texas and the four surrounding states, um, and spent a lot of time uh, traveling along the border doing border health uh, kinds of issues. During this period of time, um, I also um, spent six years uh, working with the former trust territories of the Pacific 
These are primarily the territories that territories that Japan conquered during World War II and that the United States won back island by island by island um, during World War II and afterwards uh, were given, excuse me. And um, I think that the opposition to uh, River Bridgestone. Um, during this time, um, spent a lot of times working with those trust territories. They became trust territories because after World War II, we had military stationed along all of them from the Marshall Islands on the east to Guam and uh, the CNMI, Saipan up to the north, the Republic of Palau to the south. Um, during my time, three of those became independent nations, but are still recipients of US Public Health Service um, grants, uh, which we um, still give to them to this day. They get grants not for Medicare, Medicaid, but they do get them for STDs, um, tuberculosis, uh, community health centers, and so on. And those are the are primarily the programs that I work with out there, including uh, Gel Health. Um, so, um, one of the other things that I did in Palau, which was a newly independent country, I went out there and wrote the implementing legislation for the legislature to implement licensure for physicians, nurses, uh, native practitioners, and others. And then I wrote the regulations, the implementing regulations for the department. It's actually a ministry of health, but it's equivalent to the Department of Health and Human Services here, but for the ministry to implement uh, these uh, laws. Um, we went out there and did training on tuberculosis care, on Hansen's disease, which is otherwise known as leprosy, um, and on sexually transmitted infections. Uh, so we did a lot of very good work out there at the time, uh, did some assessments of the pharmacy structure out there and uh, a variety of other things on the international uh, scale. Um, I retired in 2007 after my last assignment, which was with the Food and Drug Administration, um, which I went to after being the Regional Health Administrator in Dallas. Uh, in the Food and Drug Administration, I did biomedical research monitoring, and my geographic area was from California out again through the former trust territories of the Pacific, the same little countries and uh, territories that I talked about before. This would be on food issues, but mostly what I worked on were biomedical research monitoring. So I would go unannounced into doctor's offices asked to see their research on, a, on one or more studies, uh, do assessments, work on developing the assessment tool for doing the assessments, and then assess their uh, conformance to following the protocol. Uh, there is another um, kind of facility called Good Laboratory Practices, GLPs. And so I'd go into um, preclinical labs, like, for example, at UCSF, uh, University of California uh, in San Francisco, Stanford uh, in pharmaceutical companies and look at their conformance to good laboratory pr uh, practices, which they had to conform to. I went in and assessed studies um, at pharmaceutical companies and uh, device manufacturing companies. Um, I didn't look at the manufacturing process directly. That was um, other pe people with other expertise by look at the research that they based it on. So after retiring from there, I decided I wanted to put my feet back on the ground and I was the uh, health director. That means the top officials, official for a local health department and a, um, um, the, the chief medical officer for Nevada County, which goes from the Central Valley of California over and within 13 miles of Reno, it's all in California. And then Yolo County, which is by Sacramento, and then over to Reno uh, for a couple of years, uh, and then down to the Southern Nevada Health District where I retri retired a couple of years ago. Um, things change. I retired in uh, right before COVID started and um, things just didn't work out. I uh, couldn't travel, couldn't do much. So I ended up doing contract work for health departments 
And for school districts, primarily uh, community college school districts, I still do a little bit of work for uh, one of those now. Um, this is again, post-retirement, all of this. Um, I'd started the Nevada Public Health Institute uh, back about 15 years ago. And then uh, with a buddy of mine from the School of Medicine at University of Nevada at Reno, both of us are still on the board. We have three other board members. One is a dentist, one is a behavioral health specialist, one is a public health specialist. Uh, John, who was my co-founder, is a research specialist for the School of Medicine. And, and what we do now is really uh, do uh, developmental work for the rural counties in Nevada, which do not have health departments at all. Uh, so we work with the uh, boards of health, which are composed of the commissioners of health, the sheriff and the health officer, which each county has to have uh, to help them to develop either a health department or a health district. I won't go into the different definitions of that. Since that time, we were successful in getting one health district now called the Central Nevada Health District uh, that goes from not Carson City, but just east of Carson City out west and is composed of four counties. I'm still on the board of the Health Officers Association of California, where I've been for uh, fifth, maybe 18 years now. And so I participate with them. I'm on the board of regents for the American College of Preventive Medicine. And one of the more fun things I have done is about a year and a half ago, I did the nonprofit, uh, wrote the nonprofit uh, implementing uh, regulations and got nonprofit status for a square dance club in Las Vegas. Uh, we are called, uh, and you have to get the drift, the Alien Eights. Uh, many square dance club Ha clubs have the word eight in them because there are eight dancers. Alienates also has the reference to Area 51, which is by uh, Las Vegas. Uh, and so we thought it would be a fun name. Uh, we're dancing most every Saturday, unless we can't get a square. <laughs> Next slide. So this was supposed to be meant, meant, meant to be a discussion, if, Rachel, if uh, Dr. Dowu, if you can come in. So what are the roles in governmental public health? Well, you've heard some of my roles in public health in, at the federal level and uh, Dr. Dowu's roles um, at the federal level. And I've worked then for another uh, 12 years, 13 years at the county level, worked very closely with the states. So state federal and local is where you can work. Um, and coming right out of residency, you can become a TB controller, uh, which means that you run the TB department at a major uh, health department like in DC or Baltimore or San Francisco or the STI uh, departments, or you can work in primary care in some of those same departments. There are a variety of things you can do. You can apply for a rural a governmental county and become the director, even right out of residency, probably. Rachel, uh, Dr. Dowu, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, yeah, think, I think I think what seems to have an echo. You're no, on. you're good to go. You're good to go now. Okay, um, I, I think your career illustrates the beauty of um, not pigeonholing yourself, particularly if you're someone who does embrace diversity and experiences that are broad. And um, I think you probably, Dr. Eiser, from what I'm hearing in your, your story, are very good at taking skills and um, lessons that you've absorbed from one setting and pivoting and applying them to others. Some people, I really thrive at that. And I would say other people, their skills are really much more being an expert of one thing and getting really, really into the into the to the meat and potatoes of how that particular um, part of the health system needs to be addressed or supported. So, I think having a good sense of what ignites you and what gets you excited is a is an important thing. I think for me, um, you know, I certainly had uh, an opportunity when I was going through training to think about wanting to serve in in, in resource challenged contexts and wanting to find those who had less access to healthcare and find a way to be a meaningful co contributor to the improvement in their health status, I could have made those same choices in the state of the United States. We certainly have 
a number of areas in the U.S. I think you highlighted um, the the touch the touch of your career on border issues and refugees and migrants. You talked about um, uh, Indian in Indian populations, Native American populations, where there are um, uh, needs that uh, go far beyond. Uh, uh, what we might have imagined coming out of medical school. I appreciated very much hearing that there's even just straight up health departments that don't exist and a lot of rural committed communities just need support. So I could have made that choice and I think had a very fulfilling path as what in, in serving in that way. I think for me, I just always knew that my fire is lit up. I think it's because of my, my bicultural heritage and being in settings where um, I'm around people that are not like me, and um, I'm around pe places where multiple languages are being spoken, uh, and I'm I'm forced to interact with people from different cultures. I, it's just how I'm wired. I, I like being in places where there's a lot of a lot of um, um, uh, cultural richness, and so I think I always gravitated overseas because it's just part and parcel. When I show up. I, you know, I carry my American hat. I carry my hat as a child of, of African immigrants. I carry, a, you know, a hat of um, uh, being a uh, underrepresented minority in medicine. And then I go overseas and I find yet another set of uh, cultural identities that other people are carrying. And so for me, that gets me very excited to figure out how to be part of that mix. So um, I, I think maybe to answer your question, Dr. Iser, it's it's really um, just an openness and a willingness to say lots of different environments can um, help me um, find my, I can find my niche in, in lots of different environments. Thanks. And I, I would agree with that. I think you can tell that from my history. There are no more generous people, no more poorer people in the word, world than in some of these islands that I worked on in the Marshall Islands. Uh, in the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, they are generous to a fault. I remember many times when I've spent uh, a lot of times uh, teaching in some of these courses and working with them, they would serve me the fish heads. And that is really a food item of honor. Uh, so I know how to eat fish cheeks. Uh, I don't dig into it and eat fish brains, but I do eat uh, as much of the fish head as I can, otherwise you're disrespectful. Uh, the Islanders uh, have song and dance and they honor you with their singing and dancing. Uh, uh, Dr. Dowu, I'm sure that's happened to you um, as well. And the one thing that it has helped me with, and I bet you it has you, is my first lecture to anyone on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which wasn't called that at the time, was in uh, 1990, utilizing uh, healthy people 2000 as a model to look at uh, Texas and the four surrounding states and the various ethnicities in those states. And if you were to put your money um, on ethnicities and you wanted to get the biggest bang for your buck, in Louisiana, it's clear it has to be the African-American population. In New Mexico, it's clear it's the Native American population. And that was my first lecture that I did throughout those five states. Um, and that is now the basis for a lot of what we do in public health. I just reviewed a grant proposal from ACPM and the the, juxt, the the gist of that entire grant is DEI. And that's really important for those of us in public health. Anything to add, Rachel? Thanks so much, Dr. Eiser. I see some questions in the Q&A. So if I could pose this first one to you, it says, what does the day to day look like for a health commissioner at the local level? Oh my gosh, that's one of the benefits of being a health commissioner or being for me a health director um, is the diversity of what you do. I can do anything from meeting with the hospitals and hospital systems in my jurisdiction uh, to meeting with the press and talking about uh, COVID or novel H1N1 or measles outbreak or tuberculosis in schools or um, uh, working with the community health centers or working with my staff to develop a community health center, which we did and were successful at doing uh, at Southern Nevada Health District, or working on a residency program. Or in my case, my uh, commissioners allowed me to work on the rural counties next to me. They didn't pay any of my salary, those other rural counties, but I was able to go up there and take some clinical services, including some oral health services up there. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, and teaching in the medical schools, teaching in the residency programs. Uh, it's so diverse that it's only dependent on 
One, are you rural and how rural are you? And, or are you urban and how urban are you? Uh, so in Reno, there's only one medical school and one school of public health. Down in Las Vegas, there are three medical schools and I'd say one and a half schools of public health with another one being developed. Uh, so it's uh, uh, um, how many are there in uh, LA, for example, you can, the diversity of what you can do is immense. Dr. Ido, if I may, would you mind answering the same question? Because I'm interested in hearing what a typical day looks like for you in your role. Okay. Well, I can talk about my day today. Um, and I think, again, back to this idea of knowing yourself, I I, I appreciate that at least a, a, as a country director, there is a... Um, there's a need to pivot, just as he was describing for as a health commissioner, there's a need to pivot for a lot of things. So I started off my day today uh, greeting a CDC headquarters expert that's come in uh, to Liberia to assist with uh, helping providers, clinical providers here, change their behavior around when they choose to do a malaria test. And there's a whole lecture we could give on what you do with a febrile patient and here in Liberia where malaria, malaria prevalence is high, what goes into the thinking of a provider and why they go straight to doing a rapid diagnostic test, when or when they choose to uh, uh, follow the algorithm to go on to a microscopy as confirmation or when they choose to just treat clinically. But bottom line is we have a lot of providers doing uh, things that are not part of clinical best practices. And so her her whole focus, she's come here for a week of, 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 of assessments so she can give recommendations, is to just help us think through why the pro providers are behaving the way they are and what we can do to get them to follow the algorithms that um, are needed for malaria diagnostics and treatment. So I pivoted from that to going to a meeting with our um, acting ambassador uh, once a week, uh, all the heads of um, agencies that are sent over by the federal government to have a base here in Liberia get together and we share a report of what our agency has been working on. So at that meeting in the health sector alone, we have uh, four, four agencies. Uh, Department of Defense has a health program here, so they report out. Uh, USAID, which is the U.S. Agency for International Development, um, CDC, my, my agency, and the National Institutes of Health, we all have representatives at country level. We present our um, our updates to a, a, a much bigger group of people uh, that includes uh, representatives from the International Narcotics and um, Law Enforcement uh, Agency. I don't know that many people would have heard of them, but they're essentially the um, overseas equivalent of the FBI. Um, very loosely, I think they might might take take offense at that. But bottom line is they do a lot of work like the FBI does, but they help countries um, uh, uh, with that type of capacity. So I'm in a meeting talking to people who have law enforcement expertise. I'm in a meeting um, talking to um, another section that uh, presents that meeting is the consular section. They're the group of people that basically help Liberians who want to travel to the U.S. for any number of reasons, student visas, whatever. Um, uh, get their visas, but they also are the uh, part of our, our agency, our overseas agencies that help American citizens living abroad, right? So if you're living in the um, in a foreign country, you need access to the embassy to potentially do any number of um, uh, service, access any number of services related to your citizenship with the United States. So the consular section is there for American citizens. So all of those people are sitting around a table, essentially briefing the uh, acting ambassador and each other on our activities. And so from there, um, I came um, back to my desk, I started working on a portfolio review that we're doing for the next two days. Um, we're going to bring all of the, the par partners that CDC is funding uh, into a room, uh, and it's about eight partners, so they can talk about the last five years of funding that they've received from the U.S. CDC by um, thematic area, because uh, we fund various things in public health. Uh, and it's our it's our time to kind of showcase and tell our story of what CDC has done really well in Liberia, but then also kind of cast a vision for what we're going to do with our next round of funding, as many of these partners are coming to the end of their grant period. Um, and from there, I went to the Ministry of Health. I met with the minister herself um, and talked about some issues that we're having around getting a digital vaccine registry launched uh, for the country, trying to essentially take informatics expertise that CDC, CDC, has, CDC has, has. Uh, informatics expertise that CDC has and put it in um, a, a, a tablet format tablet format that individual healthcare providers can access so they can upload vaccine re register re records digitally into a registry. Uh, that way we have a, a good picture longitudinally of the vaccines that people are giving get, get, uh, being given over the course of their lifetime rather than what is right now is happening is that 
if I get my my birth dose of polio and um, uh, uh, TB and uh, B, uh, BCG and um, let's just say measles in one facility and then my family moves me to another part of Liberia, that other facility in another part, part of Liberia has no record of what I, I received because it's all paper driven. So we're trying to introduce very slowly a digital registry that can be access, accessible nationwide. Um, and then I finished that meeting, went and spoke with uh, other colleagues uh, in the Public Health Institute of Liberia, and now I'm here with you um, uh, talking about careers. So that's a day, a typical day, lots of meetings, lots of conversation that definitely pivot from place to place. Um, and some days we end up at health facilities talking to providers and, and patients too. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think, Dr. Doe, you have additional questions. Oh, okay. Um, how do these careers? Um, well, I, I think it, I'm going to let Dr. Eiser take this one first. He's okay. had more more years to have an experience here. How do these careers fit with family life? Are you able to relocate with your family internationally or within the U.S.? Well, a lot of my stations were actually within the U.S., uh, so I, I did have family here. Um, I raised uh, one son who is now, I hate to tell you this, about 40, I believe he turns 40 this year, who's got two kids. Uh, it is easier to see him and the two kids when they're not sick, since now I'm older, I don't have that red hair and red beard that I used to have. Uh, so um, it it has been fairly easy for me. I, do I did have a travel schedule that kept me away for three months at a time, and we just worked it out. Dr. Dowu. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know, if you're interested in working overseas, particularly if you're willing to um, take the adventure of moving with your entire family, um, you're you're going to have a lot of options uh, in ways you can do that. I would say the best support to you, um, uh, a partner that you might be traveling with and any uh, children or household members you have, um, is to associate with the federal government. Um, I think whether you choose to go through the State Department, uh, the State Department hires family practice, general practitioner uh, individual. So I would think your 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 typical PrevMed doc uh, could be um, uh, on the list, but you would have to kind of do your homework and figure that out. But they hire uh, general practitioners, both nurse practitioners as well as um, doctors to staff uh, clinics in the, inside the embassies. So I, when I need to see someone um, uh, immediately and I don't have the time to go to the United States to go do routine um, checks, I get to see an American doc doctor who's based here in the embassy in Liberia. And those doctors are staffed all over the world. And when you move with the State Department, they literally move your household. You get a weight, weight allowance. It's almost embarrassingly large, um, but you get a very generous weight allowance. They let you move your pets. They let you take bring a car um, uh, and they let you bring your family. And then they will send your kids to school wherever you, you can find a, a decent school that is um, up to American standards in your region of the world. Um, and they will pay for all of it. That's that's the US State Department and that's diplomatic life. CDC is not quite as generous as that. Um, uh, we are not officially a foreign service agency. So we don't get a lot of all the bells and whistles that people who um, choose diplomatic life through the State Department mechanism get, but we do get several of those um, I would say moving allowances or entitlements that allow us to also move fa family, household, and 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 um, uh, uh, belongings uh, overseas, and they and they will move you every single time. They'll pack you and move you. So I would say if you're worried about being able to live a full life overseas, that that should not be your concern, um, especially when you're affiliated with um, all of the sort of resources that come with being a diplomat of the U.S. government. Um, most of the time when we're overseas, um, there's a very robust community of Americans. Um, if that is something that is really important to you to be around people who feel like home, um, you will uh, have opportunity to interact with Americans in the, the mission community, both because of the workplace that you're in uh, at the at the embassy, but also those who have moved with their families. Um, generally, they will have a, a lot of sort of socialization and um, uh, sort of uh, engagement to keep to keep uh, uh, it feeling like you're not completely isolated. Um, and then there, as I mentioned, Amer Liberia is one of the countries that has a tremendous number of American citizens living overseas. And I think we could probably name maybe the top five or 10 countries on, an, on any continent where we can think of several American citizens who have chosen to live an expatriate life. So even if for some reason you're not immediately gravitating to associating with American diplomats, you can find a huge, um, 
um, sort of pool of American uh, friends and, and community members to, to get to know who are choosing to live overseas. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I think it's, it's very doable. It does take a little bit of a mindset shift. Um, getting back to the States, depending on where you're posted, can be as easy as a direct flight from Ghana to JFK or Ghana to Dallas or Atlanta, um, uh, or it could be several pops, depending on how connected that post is. I know where uh, Dr. Iser served in the in the uh, um, the islands, you are going to be doing lots of hops and then a few boat rides. <laughs> so you just have to be thoughtful. If, if traveling back to the States multiple times a year is really important to you, be, be wise about the countries you pick to work in. I hope that helps. I might add, um, Anita, is Dr. Smith going to um, talk to this group at some point? I I hope so. Yeah, I think he's one of the attendees right now. I don't believe we, he's he's ah. able to speak, but I, I we would love to engage um, Dr. Hunter Smith if if we can in a future webinar. Yeah, so Hunter knows me very well, and I think he um, he, he would agree that my career, unlike uh, Dr. Duwu's, is a little bit more like the militaries, where you have deployments overseas, some of which may be very uh, short, three months, four months, six months. Um, and uh, in my case, family stayed at home. Uh, I kept in contact with them and, and came home. It is very doable. Uh, and that way, um, uh, my kid went to high school at the same high school, didn't have to uh, change during his uh, last few years in, in high school. Other questions, Dr. Dowu? Yes, um, there's a question here. While working internationally, what political challenges have you experienced while trying to address mistrust of American interventions in your host country? Um, I always used uh, good humor. I always used honesty. I always used flexibility. Uh, when I went to Palau and they want and to write those regulations and that law, if they wanted me to do something else, which was to see some patients because I'm also an internist, I did that. They gave me, I had a license to practice there. Um, so um, I think good humor goes a long way. And like Dr. Duwu, whenever I was in one of the foreign countries, and there are three of those there, um, I always met with the ambassador to find out what she or he wanted or needed um, as well. Um, so. I think honesty, I remember one time I was at a meeting, it was all these jurisdictions, and I said, I'm from the US government and I'm here to help, which is famous as a saying. <laughs> it was meant to be a joke and everyone burst out laughing and I was uh, uh, immediately accepted into their ranks. Um, I will... Uh sort of try to answer that question. Thank you, it came from Ayana Vasquez. Um, thank you for the question. With with trying to always take a step back and ask yourself, um, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish? Because even as your question is phrased, it says mistrust of American interventions. And I, I don't come to most of the countries I've worked in overseas with American anything. I come saying um, I am here on behalf of the United States government, um, I have training and skills to offer. Most of the time, what we are offering in, in the CDC's context is help getting to internationally recognized best practices. The countries that invite CDC in have already agreed that they want to adhere to international health, regu health, health regulations. They want their populations to be safe, healthy, to have longevity. And so we are often trying to work with them to figure out what's the best way for them to get to that. Um, we often can bring some of the expertise that we come in with in terms of technical skills, our clinical training, our epidemiological um, analytic skills. Um, but there are going to be interventions that we do in the United States that have no applicability here um, because of the uh, challenges that are on the ground in terms of re real real time resource constraints. Um, and my job is less to try and bring wholesale American style healthcare systems here. In fact, with the minister today, I, I was already, I was talking about the merits of trying to do this digital vaccine registry. And I was very careful to say, you don't hear me saying, let's turn this into an electronic health record. Because I, I personally think Liberia struggles with internet, they struggle with power, 
nine months out of the year, most of the country is cut off because of the rainy season and there's no roads into the deepest part of the countries, uh, the deepest sections of the country. This is not the place where we want to roll out an electronic health health record where literally every provider is trying to do point of care uh, chart writing at at the bedside or at the at the point of um, outpatient in, in encounters. But somehow, if 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 you came with an American mindset that that's the gold standard of trying to maintain a clinical a clinical record, you would you would fail miserably here. So I I, I think we try really really hard to think about. What's going to get give Liberia the best access to its own story, its own information, uh, so that when it comes, when push comes to shove, when there is a suspect Ebola case or when there's a suspect measles outbreak, they have the tips and the tools at their fingertips that keep the problem as localized to Liberia as possible and doesn't spread and spill over to other countries, just destabilizing their health and possibly also spreading to the United States. So I, I hope that was a helpful question. I hope that was a, a helpful answer. It is a difficult question. I did want to say real quickly before um, we go to those last few slides, um, someone has asked about um, language. And I'll just say that uh, be really thoughtful about what you want to get out of your language background. If you really want that diplomatic life, one of the great things about working for the State Department as a physician um, or a health trained person is that they will pay for language training for wherever they assign you. And they won't let you leave the country. They won't let you leave the United States until you pass competency levels in that language. CDC, unfortunately, because it's not a foreign service agency, has historically not invested systematically in language training. I was able to get Portuguese language training before I went to Mozambique uh, because I did not come with a Portuguese background and they really wanted my particular clinical skill set. So they were willing to give me time to do that. But most of the assignments that CDC offers is they, they would prefer that you come with your Spanish or your Portuguese or, or whatever the um, uh, or French, whatever the language is of the assignment that you're going to say, so they will recruit based on that. So I would encourage you to be working on language skills now, if you feel like the pathway you're going to go isn't necessarily going to pay for that later in later in your career. Um, back to you, Anita. Um, anything, uh, I can um, share it back to you, Dr. Doe, if you want to cover this slide, and then I can cover the last two slides. Yeah, so uh, Anita had asked us to try to to package a couple things for you guys to think about um, what are your take home reflections, for lack of a better word, reflections or questions, uh, as you think about your overseas or international approach to an international career or a career with government. And I, these are the things that I think as I look back at my career, I really, I really just had had a certainty about. Um, and then it just became a question of how to go about it. So the three questions are, what do you want to work on? How do you want to work on it? And what will give you the most pride to look back on? So with what do you want to work on next, please, Anita? For me, I just kind of knew as I was coming out of residency, I, I, and I, I told you this a little bit about my bio, I really wanted to work on big problems that cost lots of money to fix. I don't know why, but I'm not afraid of complicated issues. Um, and I don't mind if it's an expensive problem, because I feel like using dollars well is how we solve problems, not by shying away from expensive things. Um, I wanted to stay upstream. I realized after being in surgery that it was just not, it's not good enough for me to work on one patient at a time and, and to work on one patient at a time, like, and then um, never see them again. So I really wanted to do things that I felt like had longitudinal work. So, and I wanted to save lives at a, at a high level in terms of how did I want to work on it? You can do what I do at any um any stage of the game from community all the way up to national government. You saw that very nicely with Dr. Iser's career. I had a sense for me, next uh, I, Anita, that I have a, a, a desire to run things. I mean, again, it's kind of weird to say, but I just came out of residency realizing I like being in a, a position to shape something, to build it from nothing and take it to its full expression. And generally to get that type of work um, you need to be willing to take on a director role or a um, an advisor role. And so I just knew kind of coming out of my skill sets in residency that I'm I'm really good at leading. And I, I had this sense that I would be better off being directors, a director type um, 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 in a, a career going towards a director versus someone who wants to work truly at the local level. Um, I also feel like I'm the kind of person who's always looking at, uh, uh, you know, five, six, seven steps down the road. And so I'm very good at anticipating things. Um, and so I wanted to be in a part of the public health universe that sort of rewards people who can see, it, not necessarily see into the future, but see or anticipate what things might play out like after you take a course of action. Um, and that that gives me a lot of joy to put, put those skills into a public health space. And in that last question, I'll just say this quickly, what gives me the most pride to look back on? 
um, is that people people remember me, not just the papers I published. And so I knew I wanted to work in a way that would allow me to have maximal contact with people um, and to be able to represent the Uni U United States government person to person, not just on a on a on a, on a publication and uh, on a website somewhere. Um, and then this last one is just working myself out of the job. My my job it gives me a lot of pride because if I do it well, I've put enough capacity in Liberia and in the the people around um, the CDC office here who will take on this work even after I'm gone. Um, so just again, just think about that as the frame for how you make your decisions about what level or what type of career you want to have. Thanks, Anita. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And again, um, uh, as you know, we've got extraordinary members, including Dr. Idowu and Dr. Iser, and we can have them each come back for multiple parts, but we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I just want to quickly um, you know, um, wrap up with a couple of action items. We do have special interest groups, um, including one in global health, um, pharmaceutical health, artificial intelligence, and digital health. Um, as members, you can choose to be engaged in any of them um, and or, or all of them. You will have a chance to meet and be a part of these special interest groups um, at our annual conference, our signature event, taking part next month um, in Washington, D.C. Our advanced registration um, uh, rate ends on March 31st, so it's coming up at the end of this week. So if you, have, if you haven't had a registered yet, please go ahead and do so. And of course, we are always here for you. If you have any questions, please go ahead and email membership at acpm.org. If you're interested in any of these special interest groups or if you have any questions about um, or any topics that you have you want to hear um, in the future. Um, also, because this is career conversations, I just wanted to quickly point out that we also have a online career center. Um, we hope to have a webinar in the future um, just to exclusively share more about the career center. But for now, um, you know you can you can use that QR code, and this webinar is also recorded and it'll be shared with our members. Um, and so the career center is easy to use. It's um, targeted resource that uh, we it syncs healthcare employers hiring managers and recruiters. It is more than just a job board. Um, you know, we have, um, we try, try very hard to make sure preventive medicine jobs are exclusively available um, at this career center. You can search by keyword, job title, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got other exciting things planned in the coming, uh, in this year, um, specifically um, to support our members um, with their career pathway and their career journey. And with that, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and say thank you again for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing. And um, uh, if Dr. Doe and Dr. Iser want to stay back for a little bit longer to answer any questions, um, you know, they're, you're welcome to stay and ask questions. But it would, if not, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. And uh, this is the end of the webinar. Thank you all for joining, everybody.